Okay, hello everybody. My name is Mihai Karabash. Uh, first of all, I want to apologize. I had a talk in the morning and it got, got moved at uh, 3.30 due to uh, some issues with, with my paperwork with the flight here. So sorry again for this uh, uh, schedule modification. Today I'm going to talk about identity management in University Polytechnic of Bucharest, Romania. It's 300 kilometers in the, in the north. We are very, uh, are very close from here. First of all, uh, I will present myself, then I'll talk about our organization size because it's directly related to the identity management framework we have written, and then I will talk a little about the setup we have uh, regarding the directory services. It will be a talk um, between business management and technical stuff in the middle, okay? If you want to go into more detail, uh, technical details, please ask me and I will go, okay? So, some things about me. I'm an associate professor at the University of Political Bucharest. This is my base job. Uh, I finished my PhD in 2017, uh, sorry, in virtualization on embedded systems. Basically, I had a phone and I have written a virtualization framework in order to be able to run two operating systems at the same time. For example, two Android OS on the same phone. Uh, in my spare time, I'm hosting all the production services uh, in the whole university because we have a very poor IT department. I'm basically involved in managing all of these. E-learning platforms, identity management system, which I'll be talking about today, cloud services, and also grid services. Um, these are some pictures of our data centers. This is a topology. We have three main data centers connecting between them with 40, 80 gigabits per second. Uh, we have a couple of thousands of cores, uh, CPU cores, and also we have some powerful GPUs from NVIDIA Tesla. All of these are used for uh, high performance computing, and all of these are uh, basically managed using the identity services I'll be talking a little bit later. So every student who wants to run something here, it will be authenticated uh, using an LDAP service. Uh, let me talk about a little about the size of the organization because it will answer basically the technical decision I have taken in the next slides. So in the university there are 14 faculties, 3,000 employees, professor and administrative personnel, and also there are 25,000 students yearly. Okay? From 2007 until now we got in our LDAP 100,000 identities. Uh, please bear in mind that one student, uh, when, it, when it goes from one year to another, from bachelor to master and PhD, it has the same identity. We, we only create him a new profile. This is why we don't have uh, much more identities, okay? Because from these students, someone, uh, some of them repeat every year because they go from first year to second year and so on. Uh, how do we provision all of these identities. Of course, doing this manually by the secretary, it will be, it will be almost impossible. So for this, we have written a framework. And we have used as data sources the current databases that already exists in the university. So we have the student's database. It was a custom one written by one of my colleagues. So it didn't have anything special. It has a backend of MySQL. So it's an SQL backend and it's running on MySQL server. And for human resources databases, we are giving a lot of money to some external companies, and it's running on Oracle database. Uh, in order to be able to use this data, we have written a custom framework. It is composed of a front end. Basically, when I say here front end, at this point, there are multiple scripts. We don't have a CLI or a web, uh, a web interface. Um, it's written in Perl, uh, which have chosen Perl, I don't know, six years ago because it, for its good support, sorry, on here, UTF-8. In Romanian, in Romanian language, we have a lot of special characters like, like C versus T, uh, SH versus S, and so on. All of these had to be interpreted, interpreted and uh, translated very well in the LDAP. Uh, moreover, there are multiple kind of C. So, and this was a, 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 um, this was a challenge for the other languages like Python or Bash to interpret at that point. Right now, I I have to recognize that 
some of this support have been improved, but at that point, Perl had the most rigorous way of interpreting UTF-8 uh, characters. Uh, backend was written as procedures in SQL. Why this? Because we didn't want to depend on a language. This, this was the first um, uh, reason we have chosen this approach. Or at this point, uh, here are, I don't know, a couple of hundred, hundreds of lines of code, 500 lines of code. And if someone wants to rewrite this front end in Python or create a web interface, it is very simple for, it, for them. Um, and also we have chose SQL because all the data sources are usually stored in SQL databases, especially when coming to, uh, when talking about people, okay? Uh, also, it has some connectors which are tied to the backend in order to pull data from different databases. Basically, these connectors are some SQL queries you have to write in order to get data from the databases into our own framework. Here we had multiple issues in uh, maintaining on a day-by-day -day basis the accuracy, the synchronization between these databases, our, our database, and the LDAP infrastructure. And I will talk a little bit about this in the next slides. How do we manage changes? How do we get new users? The answer was simple. Create a custom SQL key to exclude the current users we have already gotten in the previous queries. But the second question, how do we get changes for the current users? Maybe for the current users, something modified, like their names. We have a lot of situations. Okay? How do we get these changes? Basically, we had to iterate through each user and make a query to see if there are any changes. But doing this for 25 entries takes a lot of time. And also, it is a very important aspect here, put a big stress on the source database. Okay, for example, this custom SQL, because it was very complex, we, we were basically uh, uh, creating, we were creating a DDoS attack or a DOS attack on the source database for the student's database because it wasn't, it, it is a MySQL instance and it does not manage very well when, when we create complex SQL queries here. Okay, um, what was our approach? Get all the data with a single select star query. Basically, uh, for example, every night we get all the data. This returns a lot of data, but it's very fast. We don't put any stress on the source database. And we also have a lot of bandwidth. We have a gigab a gigabit links or 10 gigabit links. So this isn't a problem for us. We use two tables on our, let's say, local framework. One with the current query and one with the previous query. And we basically, uh, using a stored procedure. So this is another reason I, we used stored procedures because we already have the data, uh, the raw data in SQL, okay? And we will do a difference between these two, two tables and we will basically issuing three operations. Add the data to be added, remove the data to be removed if something disappeared from there, or modify. Modify the object that already exists. Uh, this remove is with a question mark because we do not remove anything, okay? We, we just flagged the, the objects as removed, but they remain in our um, framework and also in our LDAP. Um, at the beginning of, the, uh, of each year, all the secretaries from our faculties are creating the new contracts for all the students. So we have basically 25 new um, students to, to process. And it takes about three, four hours because the difference between the, the, the current table and the last table is basically 25,000. After that, for subsequent synchronization, we run the synchronization process each night because uh, in, in our university, each day something modifies, a new student comes, another goes, and so on. And it takes about five minutes with our, um, with our uh, algorithm. So this is how we have designed our framework. This is how we have been using it. And the main problem was scalability here. We have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of traffic. A lot of students are coming in and going out every year. Uh, let's talk a little about the implementation of the directory services. First of all, which were the prerequisites when we started to implement this? We had to provide um, 
centralized authentication to internal services we are managing. Usually they are open source, like e-learning platform, email server, Wi-Fi authentication. And also provide authentication for external services. We as a university have a lot of access to a lot of products from Microsoft, but Microsoft imposes some restrictions on how to access those, those products. Uh, basically, you cannot do this directly, for example, with an open LDAP or um, 3890S directory server. Um, you need to have an Active Directory on-premise. This is why we have chosen the following setup. A 3.9 directory server, uh, which has a sync agreement with an Active Directory. Basically, every object we add in the 3.9DS is automatically synchronized to Active Directory and vice versa. But our framework usually works with 3.9DS. Also, uh, I had some questions in the break uh, about the password synchronization. 3.9DS has support for password synchronization. At the beginning, when you are doing synchronization, it synchronizes only the information, the name, first name, username, and so on, but not the password, because it cannot create an, a hash for Active Directory from the hash of 3.9DS. But whenever a user changes the password here, it automatically computes the hash and it gets the hash also to Active Directory. And also, uh, the other way around is true. We have installed an agent provided by the 3890S team on Active Directory and whenever someone changes the password here, it is automatically written here also. So it's a bidirectional uh, way synchronization, data and password. Okay. Both of these are on-premise on our servers. Uh, for the 3 and 9 uh, directory server setup, we, had, uh, we have a Fedora 29 and this point I will do an upgrade to 30 soon. We usually have CentOS 7 or, on all our infrastructure, but we have chosen uh, Fedora here because we want to have the latest packages from 3 and 9 years when they are released because the, the 3 and 9 years team first releases the packages uh, for Fedora and Red Hat and so on. At this point, we are at 1.4.0.27, one uh, almost the latest version. There are two or three minor versions here. Um, I'm usually reluctant to do upgrades, so uh, I'm doing upgrades once a year. I know that, that if everything goes okay, I'm doing upgrades once a year. Um, usually I know that our uh, security fixes, bug fixes, and so on. Uh, but at each upgrade in this complex setup, a problem appears. And I have to debug it to find it where it is and fix it. Um, usually, this directory is, an, uh, is an in, in an internal zone, DMZ, and is accessible only by our servers. So it is not directly exposed to the internet to be accessible from there. Uh, how do we house this? So we have an um, HA cluster f uh, using some Hyper-V um, <coughs> virtual machines. Uh, basically, the 3A9DS is a virtual machine running on the Hyper-V cluster. Why are we doing this? Because we have live, mi live migration. For example, if a no physical node fails, automatically the VM is restarting, restarted on another, another node and so on. Uh, my target here is to move the virtual machine from here to, uh, to the cloud infrastructure on OpenStack. We have also an uh, OpenStack infrastructure, but unfortunately, OpenStack has a very agile development, um, development way of doing things, and they introduce a lot of bugs in the releases. And it is pretty tricky to have a stable OpenStack infrastructure at this point. Uh, I allocated all, all, uh, gigabytes of uh, eight, sorry, eight gigabytes of RAM, but only one is used, so it is not so resource hungry. Uh, okay, about here is the synchronization setup. So we have a sync agreement with AD. We, we are with our AD. When we created the sync agreement, you see here I told the agreement what part of my directory to synchronize. I want to synchronize this one. Oh, you people all the other parts that are outside of this subtree won't be synchronized. 
okay? And basically, the replication is done incrementally. Um, if something goes wrong with the change log and the sequence numbers, uh, se sequence numbers um, go off, goes off or, s or so, you have the option to do a refull synchronization. Basically, all your objects will be resynchronized. It takes about, for us, for one, 100,000 objects, it takes about, I don't know, one hour, one hour and a half. It, it, it depends. Uh, here is our structure. Basically, under, under people, we have the name of the faculties. For example, ACS here is the automatic control and uh, computing science faculty, and we have other faculties also. Each faculty has teachers, here is professor in, Ro uh, in Romanian, uh, has assistants, and also you see here a lot of years. Because we, we have a lot of users at our uh, faculty, and if we would have put all the users in one OU, you'll, we would have a very big one. And we decided to put users uh, in a special OU created with the year they entered the faculty. For example, me, I entered the faculty in 2007 and I got in this OU at that point. This, one, this way, we somehow segregated the IDs, not having all of them in one OU. Uh, what we sh issues ha we, we had had with the sync agreement between 3 and 9 DS and ID? Attribute UID, user ID, from the 3 and 9 DS, it's mapped to some account name on AD. The problem is that some account name is limited to 20 characters. First, we have built our tier 9 ds A lot of users had uh, uh, characters beyond, beyond this limit, okay? And we had to trim this because otherwise synchronization won't, won't work. This is a limitation of AD. Uh, to, to overcome this limitation in AD, basically it was introduced a new attribute, user principal name. But this one does not have a mapping in 390s and in that agreement. Basically, what, uh, what it, it is being doing, it's being copied from the same account name we are synchronizing. If we change the user ID, only same account name, sorry, here gets updated. So I had to create a background script that periodically checks and updates uh, the user principal name from the same account name. Um, also, UID and some account name have different restrictions on 390s versus uh, AD. For example, entries that are being valid in 390s are not being replicated and not being valid in AD are not being replicated. For example, take this one, Mihai.Karabas dot here is okay in 390s and not okay in AD. You'll tell me, okay, who would put a point here? At the end of uh, uh, at the end of a username, but let me tell you how do we generate this because I, we don't do not generate these users user IDs manually. We take them from the first name and last name, and this first name and last name are introduced by human beings. Secretary that doesn't have anything to do with computer science. Uh, how do we generate these usernames? Basically, we have multiple groups in our our framework adjusted during the years and we have found new, new exceptions. Basically, it's the first name, not last name. If conflicts, change the order, last name, first name, or use the first letter, for example, the M. Karabas, in my case, uh, or add numbers at the end. The numbers are taken uh, from some internal IDs to be sure that they are unique. Uh, also, we had to, to, we came to the conclusion that we had to delete non-alphanumeric, numeric, sorry, here, uh, characters from the beginning at the end. So, to get rid of this point here. Maximum 20 characters, it's a limitation of some account name I told you. Uh, we are having right now an issue from 2007 until now. At this point, we have complaints about the username because there are a lot of conflicts. For example, there are multiple Mihai Karabas in our university and we have to generate them unique UIDs which, which has numbers and a lot of them are complaining. 
For students, it's okay, but we started to have conflicts also in the uh, at the professors and the administrative personnel, and we do not know at this point what would be the right approach to over overcome this, because the professor come and say, okay, I'm a professor, I cannot have numbers in my email. But this is more like a management issue at, from my point of view. Uh, regarding the active directory setup, at this point we are at 2012 R2. Uh, we'll probably be upgrading to 2019, but uh, I, have, I have played with the 2019, uh, let's say, other services than active directory, and I, I, ha I have found a lot of bugs, and I'm just waiting a little. Uh, it has the same resources, but it's uh, very hungry, so, so this one eats all the RAM I have allocated. Basically, it have, has installed two roles, Act, Active Directory, di Directory Services and the DNS. Uh, we have 1,000, uh, sorry, 100,000 uh, users synced from TN9DS, and also we have a couple of servers. We do not have workstations in this Active Directory at this point. Okay, uh, let me do a recap of the services uh, used in our university based on LDAP, AD or G9DS. In the internal services, we have the e-learning platform. It's based on Moodle, and it's using G9DS. Employers, employer's email server, it's Zimbra, it's on-premise, it's using G9DS for authentication. The cluster infrastructure, I, I was telling you earlier, the high-performance computi computing infrastructure, uh, authentication is based is on Linux usually. It's 3 and 9 DS, and we are using the SSS, SSS D, D, daemon to configure the client for authentication. Also, we have Wi-Fi authentication. I don't know if you have heard about EduRom. It's a wireless network available for all universities in the whole world. Uh, for example, if I came in Bulgaria at the university here in Sofia and I have EduRom, I can authenticate with my username from my LDAP. It's a radius mesh network connected to each other. Uh, here, we are using uh, .1x um, authentication. The problem here, we are using Active Directory because in Windows uh, 7, it had problems with EAP TLS uh, encryption authentication. And this is why we need to use MS Chap v2, which is we, which was available only with Active Directory password hashing. And also we have a cloud infrastructure based on OpenStack, which also uses a TN9DS to authenticate users and also services. We have some external services. These are free for the university from Microsoft, Google, and VMware. Basically, we are using Active Directory, which is synchronized to an instance in Azure Active Directory. With this, we are accessing Microsoft Imagine, which provides us Windows licenses for teacher, teachers and students. And also, students are accessing their email. Um, having a lot of students, we cannot afford hosting them locally, and Microsoft offers this for free, even for teachers. But the teachers are very, the teachers and administrative personnel are very, I don't know, reluctant to move the data to, to the cloud. And also we have VMware and uh, VMware licenses based on also on this. For future steps, uh, we'll keep both technologies. So at this point, we can easily move all the things to Active Directory. So Active Directory can provide authentication for all of these with no problem. Uh, 389DS cannot provide authentication for Azure, Azure AD. Um, we chose to keep them both because at one point Microsoft, in time, Microsoft will say, okay, you don't have any more free licenses for Active Directory for our services and so on. This happened at bigger houses. For example, at CERN and Geneva, at the Accelerator, they have all the um, users in Active Directory. They have a very cheap prices per each user, and last year or two years ago, Microsoft said and came and said, okay, uh, we consider you a normal company and uh, ask them a lot of million of dollars yearly. 
tens of millions of dollars. And they decided right now to move from, uh, from Active Directory to back to other open source LDAP. And this is why we keep both of them to have options in case something happens. Uh, we also want to create an SSL portal. At this point, each, um, each service, each platform we have has their own service account which connects directly to LDAP. This is not comfortable for me because those services, for example, the e-learning platform, uh, I'm the administrator there, but also have other administrators from other faculties because I can manage all the things. And they basically have access to that service account and its password. And this is not OK. That, that is a read-only service account, but also is not OK. So this is why I want an SSL portal to redirect all the authentication to it. And also I would want to create a portal to manage the user in our framework. For, for example, at this point, uh, we have this, we have this um, database, local database with all the users, user IDs and so on, which we are using to synchronize the LDAP, to create profiles in LDAP. Uh, but it would be nice to have a portal for the users to see at what services that it has access to reset the password and so on. Uh, this is all I have wanted to present to you. If you have any questions, yes, please. How many of you, of you under OU people, OU equal people? Under OU people, we have uh, all the faculties. We, are four, uh, we have 14 faculties plus the rectorate. We have 15 OUs under. The 39 directory server supported the sync. There's just one OU set up. No? Uh, <laughs> yes, we have one more thing here I forgot okay. to tell you about. So, so here we have a background, we have a background script. OK, now I understand what was your question. Yeah. I forgot about this. So basically, um, the 3A9DS supports only synchronizes the objects of, uh, of all the objects, all the users under people. It won't go to ACS, it won't create the OU ACS and so on. We have a background script that creates all this OU structure on AD, separate, and after that it gets synchronized. So you have to have this structure created and it will go recursively to all the OUs. Okay? It adds, okay. So, thanks for the presentation. I, I understand that you, you made yourself a lot of tools to, to manage uh, your identity. Yep. So the, the, the synchronization here, wait a second, Bet, be, between 390s and AD? This one on, or, or between uh, your SQL? Uh, okay. It, uh, it is a little bit of trouble there because in the SQL we do not have usernames. We do not have UIDs, for example. How do you synchronize? Okay, um, we had other issues at that point. Mm, I, I'm trying to remember what, wh why we started to create this from scratch. Um, at the, the SQL, at that point, the SQL queries were very complex and also at this point, and we, uh, we, we do not, so, Take for example, a student has multiple contracts, okay? And we are basically, while we are importing the user from the SQL to our database we have written, we are importing all his contracts and we are searching if there are any valid contracts and if so, we created, the, we created the username. So we basically, we have other logic than, also other logic than creating, only creating the usernames. So,
Yep, yep. I, I hope that you will not uh, put it from your own hand. Uh, so we, ha we have a running simple SM SAML PHP at this point, uh, but it, 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 it is not customized with the university logos and so on. Now we will not code it from, from scratch, but again here, uh, here it was more, we need this custom, custom thing because it was, nothing was stable at the beginning. Also, for example, I told you that there are two data sources. Let me, okay, student databases and human resources database. Please bear in mind that some of the people here are also here. And we didn't have a unique way identifying this. And there are some, uh, in the back there are some rules that, are, that aren't so strict to match the people. And this is why we, we chose this path. But again, we started this in 2008 at that point. Okay. Okay, uh, so again, uh, I don't want, uh, we usually reuse everything, you, uh, everything we, we find. Please look at the services we are using. So uh, e-learning platform, Zimbra, all these are open sources, open source. But at this point, uh, we had a lot of issues in stabilizing our own internal workflow. And that was the easy, easiest way at that point. So right now, if you put me, probably I won't write this from the beginning. Thank you. Sorry. So, so uh, here you see that it talks with Windows host. Yeah, but for the DS host, why don't you use that? Like, maybe you use, maybe you use. We have so so uh, uh, we have used this like we have used this at that point because uh, in the initial setup we didn't have the LDAPS activated here, but all the services in the back are using LDAPS. So only here. Probably it's just a matter of modifying the port. So right now it, 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 it works on... on uh, uh, yeah, beside port, you need to uh, switch indirectly in the also. So it will use LDAPS as a setting. Or you can use start to less and, let's see, and go for this port. But I, I, I cannot... So Okay, so uh, so here uh, talking with Windows, you cannot sync anything with Windows on three eight nine only when on uh, six three six. Okay, uh, I cannot remember how I, conf I I will look at the Windows. So it, it has been some years. So okay, uh, nice observation. Thank you. So I will look on the Windows part because there I don't know how did I configure the agent to to push the passwords with what settings. Because that one, the, that engine is somehow uh, asynchronous. It's pushing the password here. Uh, um, yes. So, also in our written framework, uh, we have an algorithm to look to see uh, if a user has disappeared. It doesn't appear in the database, or it's been deactivated. We are basically having a logic where we move all the, all the users from their OUs to an inactive OUs, and also we deactivate the account, but we preserve all of these due to history reasons. Because we also preserve contracts and so on. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you very much.